whether or not this, whether or not the slides will be available to download. Um, yes. Yes, that's right. I was going to say I'm happy to share mine, but we we'll, um, we'll put them all on the local nature partnership website and yeah. let you know where they okay, are. Okay. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to see my screen. Anyone can great got a thumbs up from Tom. Um, yeah, so as Sarah said, I'm um, Rachel Tuckett. I'm a planning officer for Devon County Council. I mostly work in um, the sort of more strategic planning side of things, but um, also do get involved in um, development management stuff as well. So let's see if I can actually move my slides. There we go. Um, so I wanted to give you kind of a quick overview, really, of um, the planning system, um, sort of the uh, kind of coming from national policy down to um, what the development plan is, what's the purpose of the local plan, what are sort of the stages of local plans and development and how we can engage you in that and how you can engage in that process. Um, so to start off with the MPPF, um, to give you an overview, this is the National Planning Policy Framework, which sets out the government's planning policies for plan making and development in England. Um, it was published in 2012 and has had its most recent revision in July 2021. It's supported by planning practice guidance online, which if you literally if you Google planning practice guidance, that will come up um, and is quite a useful um, tool for working out how we, yeah, kind of finding a way through the planning system. Essentially, it goes straight from sort of plan policy making all the way down to um, development management, down to the sort of detail of that. Um, the MPPF covers national planning issues um, and it's kind of the guide that we as planners use to um, for plan making and for development management decisions as well. Um, we are required to take it into account um, when we are forming our policies and making our decisions. And what kind of runs through the MPPF is this kind of presumption in favour of sustainable development. Um, so we as planners are um, encouraged to um, support sustainable development, be in favour of sustainable development. So our policies and our plans um, are required also to be um, kind of have that presumption in favour of sustainable development. <clears throat> I wanted to briefly mention um, just a few things about possible future changes in planning. You may have heard about this in the news and things um, if you're that interested, but um, <laughs> In 2020, the government produced um, a white paper called Planning for the Future, which proposes some really radical changes to the planning system, um, including plan making, really. The sort of kind of key proposals that I thought I'd mentioned today. Um, firstly, when we're making plans, when we're making our local plans, um, we will be encouraged to split um, all of our land in our districts into three zones, and they are growth, where development will be encouraged, where development will be acceptable. Um, renewal areas such as kind of town centres where, as it says, um, where renewal projects will be appropriate and then these kind of areas of protection. <coughs> um, the other kind of key proposal that would probably be of interest is having these sort of nationally set development management detail policies. So anything from um, design codes to what, what accounts as a significant impact on um, traffic and those sorts of things and those will which have traditionally been set at the sort of local policy level um, are proposed to be set at a national level. Um, the government had 44,000 responses, individual responses to the proposals which were quite mixed I believe. Um, there has been quite a lot of uh, political kickback on this as well so we are very much in the dark as to if this might happen and therefore when it might happen. Um, so I didn't want to go too far into that. If you are interested in kind of finding out a bit more about that, then yeah, if you put something in the chat and I'm sure Sarah will send something around for me. Um, there's lots of people that have written stuff about what might happen in the future. But as I said, it's very uncertain at the moment. Um, and yeah, we don't know if any of it will come into force. So um, yes, so I thought I'd come down to kind of more local stuff. Um, we've kind of thrown this term around a lot of the development plan. Um, that development must be in accordance with the development plan. Um, but what does that mean? At its kind of basic level, the development plan is a kind of set of documents that set out the local authorities' policies and proposals for the development and use of land in their area. Um, so as you can see from this diagram, kind of blue in the middle being the development plan. For areas such as kind of, I'll use Teambridge as an example, they've got their adopted local plan slash emerging local plan. Um, 
their made neighbourhood plans and the Devon Waste and Minerals Plan. All of those documents kind of have this sort of synergistic relationship where they should work together, um, complement each other. And those are the documents that kind of create and form the development plan. So when you hear the phrase, you know, this is in accordance with the development plan, it's in accordance with those documents, essentially is what that means. Um, a development plan is required to be consistent with national policy and relevant legislation and guidance. Um, government will give um, local areas their kind of housing numbers. They will say, this is the formula you need to work out your housing numbers and that's what you need to plan for in your local plan. And those numbers are achieved by allocating development through the local plans, through, potentially through neighbourhood plans and the waste and mineral stuff will <clears throat> sorry, obviously um, allocate waste and minerals. Um, so kind of we're sort of out of uh, locally, you're kind of a bit out of control as to the number that you are given, but there is sort of more local control as to where that happens. And that's what the local plan does. Um, in addition to that, um, the plans will have strategic and specific policies. So um, strategic kind of covering the whole area, um, those sort of the sort of spatial strategy as to where that development will be located. And then the specific policies being more the kind of detail, sort of site detail or the development management policies of, you know, each development will be expected to do this, this and this. Um, it's what we use to guide our planning decisions. We have to refer to the development plan. It's the sort of main material consideration when we are um, making decisions on planning applications. And the plans are produced in line with what we call the duty to cooperate, which means um, whilst we're producing them, we are required to cooperate with our neighbours, uh, our neighbouring authorities, and also kind of other um, strategic and statutory stakeholders, really, including things like Southwest Water, um, NHS, those kind of bodies as well. Um, so that's kind of what forms the development plan. Um, looking kind of at the local plans, um, what's the sort of purpose of the local plan? As I said, it's to guide decisions on applications. Um, it's got those allocations within it, um, but also allows for developments outside of those allocations to come forward if they meet the requirements and the policies. Um, it has this vision and framework for the future development of the area to which it relates. It should address all needs in relation to housing, economy, infrastructure, community facilities, um, historic environment, natural environment, um, pretty much anything you can think of should be in there. Um, as I said earlier, the MPPF was updated this month and um, in terms of the natural environment, the local plan is the sort of basis for conserving and enhancing the natural and historic environment and the wording now in the MPPF says um, that the local plans are required to protect and enhance the environment and to improve biodiversity, so it's been slightly strengthened um, from the previous wording. And yeah, as I said before, it's that kind of combination of strategic policies and non-strategic kind of more detailed matters that are in the local plans. Um, I wanted to have a kind of go through the local plan stages kind of as it is, this is sort of how development comes about, how it happens. Um, so as I said, um, we have that kind of government number that is sort of comes down from above where we are given um, the uh, formula to work out what our housing number should be that's based on um, local need but also kind of government targets as well. Um, so for example I think the Teambridge one is around 700 houses a year um, and obviously over the plan period that can be quite a large number of houses. Um, once they've got once we've kind of got that the local authority will first look at their sort of issues and options so that'll be what do they identify as the sort of key issues in that area and what are their options for addressing all of those things that I said before for addressing housing need um, nature conservation um, highway capacity all of those sorts of things um, once the issues and options has been consulted upon, it then goes into the sort of initial draft local plan, which will start to look more like the documents that you're probably used to seeing. Um, the ones that have the sort of sites identified, but also has all the um, development management policies. Again, that will be consulted on at that point. Um, and then it moves on to publication and submission. So the plan will be published and then submitted to the Secretary of State for um, examination. At that point, again, there is another consultation at that point. Um, 
which all goes, all of those responses go to the Secretary of State and to the Planning Inspectorate, who will then run the examination in public to test the soundness of the plan. Once that's done, once the inspector is satisfied that the plan is sound, the local authority will move on to kind of adoption and then the sort of monitoring and review stages later on. And at that point is kind of when your planning applications will start to come in for sort of your allocated sites. Um, once the plan's adopted, that will then you know, form that part of the development plan. So I've sort of split them up into, as you can see, hopefully see underneath, it sort of says consultation, participation and implementation. So those are kind of, I've tried to sort of group the stages of the plan, really. Um, so the sort of consultation and participation bit, if you're getting involved in planning application, um, in planning matters, in strategic planning matters, um, the earlier the better, responding to consultations. If you can start at issues and options and really get those kind of issues that you think, the sort of local issues that you think are really key, um, in the minds of planners at an early stage, then great, they will hopefully carry that through the process. Um, ways of doing that are kind of engaging with public and stakeholder events. Um, hasn't happened so much in the last 18 months for obvious reasons, but um, we will quite often hold public events in different towns and things when we're talking about new local plans. Um, sort of feeding in local knowledge and local data and local kind of understanding about what's going on in your local areas is really helpful. Um, and it's a real opportunity to kind of represent your community priorities. If you've got a neighbourhood plan, it's really good opportunity to represent your kind of neighbourhood plan policies. The local plan is um, required to take into account neighbourhood plans, um, but it's really helpful to have that kind of local knowledge of where those plans came from and um, how the local plan can, yeah, sort of reinforce those and support those. And that's why I've put that under participation as well, because examination in public, if there's still issues, once you've got to publication and submission, you may be asked to come and um, represent it, examination in public, where you kind of state your case at that point. But as I said, the kind of earlier the engagement, hopefully the earlier issues and um, needs can be sorted. And then you kind of move on to this implementation stage, which is kind of um, planning applications are submitted, the sort of real kind of detail of sites come forward policies start to be implemented. Um, we are required to consult on applications. Um, it's not always the easiest thing to, I'm aware, to um, know what's going on in your area. The white paper also does propose kind of changes to um, sticking bits of paper on lampposts, um, which is quite an archaic way of doing things, but that's where we are at the moment. Um, but yeah, if you're really kind of invested in your local area, it's kind of being aware of what's happening, being aware of the planning applications that might come in and again, responding to those sorts of things. And I will talk a little bit in a moment about what sort of things you can say um, and what kind of things we can take into account, really. Um, so yeah, that implementation stage is probably more the side of planning that you're used to seeing is the application submitted and sort of development coming forward, really. Um, why engage um, is a question we often get. What's the point in doing it? Um, it seems like decisions have been made. As I said, that kind of early engagement really kind of allows for planners to take into account sort of local objectives, to, for them to be planned in, for them to be considered really early on. It means that when we're thinking about sites, if we know that there is these, you know, for example, these nature conservation issues that people are really keen on, um, addressing that could be planned in at the start and that kind of becomes part of the site if it comes later on we get a lot of pushback from developers which is um can come sort of can become quite hard to fight and the sort of viability impacts and things um other kind of reasons for getting involved you know if you've got your neighborhood plans um the neighborhood plan can't contradict the local plan and vice versa so having a local plan system that is complementary of your neighbourhood plan or of your goals to create a neighbourhood plan is really helpful that we need that sort of engagement um, because the most recently adopted document in the development plan sort of takes precedence if there are conflicts. Um, again I said earlier it's that sort of local knowledge and data or evidence is really helpful um, you know we try and have as wide and broader picture as we can but obviously can't know everything about every community in Devon it can be quite tricky um, and yeah having all parties on the same page and that kind of working relationship early on 
by being on the same page, I don't necessarily mean every party agreeing, but having that sort of functioning relationship early on is can be cost saving later on. It can be time saving for yourselves and for us as well. Um, so sort of, as I said, that kind of early understanding of what's going on. Um, so what is a planning consideration? Um, what can you comment on? Um, essentially, you can comment on anything you want to, but the things that get taken into account are not necessarily all the things that you want to say. Um, I've split this into local plans and planning considerations. Um, local plans being the sort of stuff that we have to look at when we're creating the local plan. The planning considerations being the sort of more detailed, site-specific, essentially sort of planning application responses. Um, so currently the local plan tests are for whether or not the plan is legal and whether or not it's sound. Um, so soundness is split into these four things there. So is it positively prepared? Is it, does it have that kind of presumption in favour of sustainable development? Um, is it encouraging the right development in the right places? Uh, is it justified? Have you got an appropriate evidence-based strategy? Have you considered all the reasonable alternatives? Uh, is it effective? Is it actually deliverable? There's no point in putting a, an allocation in a site, a site allocation, sorry, in a plan that can't be delivered in that sort of planned period. Um, and as I said earlier, is it consistent with national policy? So when you're kind of looking at these issues and options, um, those are the kind of soundness tests, I suppose, as to um, the sort of things to be looking out for when you're commenting. Um, and going into sort of the more detailed stuff, into planning considerations, we have these things called material planning considerations that we have to take into account. There are also non-material planning considerations which we cannot use to make a decision on an application. Um, so material planning considerations include things like loss of privacy, loss of light, um, highway safety, if an application has a um, detrimental effect on highway safety or highway um, capacity then we can use that as a determinant of kind of the planning application um, noise for example does it meet those policy requirements um, effects on listed buildings nature conservation is one of those material planning considerations um, and sort of previous case law that's not an exhaustive list um, what is considered material and not um, is largely sort of tested by law but there are some that are kind of quite key which is what I've put in there um, again, a quick Google of the words material planning considerations will bring up a lot of different um, sort of guidance documents really about what can be considered material. Um, and then we have these non-material ones. So they are comments that will be, um, they're comments that you can make, but they're things that we cannot use to influence our decisions. So those are things like building regulations that people will say, well, the building is not going to be up to code. That's not a planning consideration, that's for another process, for example. Um, loss of view, um, opposition to the principle of development, if it's been set by an outline consent or at appeal, we then can't use, so if, sorry, yeah, if the principle has been set at outline or appeal, opposing that principle is not something we can do anymore. You know, we can't refuse something on principle of development if it's already been set by any of those processes. Um, private issues between neighbours, for example, um, can't be used, it's not a planning consideration. Um, personal circumstances, loss of property value um, is not a planning consideration. And this is quite a, the last one I've put on there is quite often a bit of a misconception um, that the volume of local opposition or local support in itself is not a planning consideration. We could have an application with 300 objections um, we could have an application with three objections it is no more likely that the application with three will be refused than it is that the application with 300 will be refused it's about the content of those objections if there are genuine material planning considerations that people are objecting on then those are the things we can take into account if there's 300 letters all saying the same thing you know, we don't score them saying, well, that's 300 rejections, therefore we can't permit that development. So the volume of those um, opposition or support um, can't be taken into account. Um, yeah, so I think that's kind of, it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour through, I think, of sort of planning policy stuff. Um, 
but yeah, if anyone's got any questions, I can try and offer them now, answer them now, sorry. Um, if you've got questions about kind of specific cases, specific local plans, those sorts of things, I unfortunately won't be able to answer those now. Um, it's more sort of about the general stuff. They will need to be directed to your district council, really. Um, yes, so yeah, any questions? Okay, Rachel, thank you very much. That's really useful. Um, so <clears throat> we have got a few questions in the chat. Yep. Um, so if I just put these to you now. Yep. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so the first one is more of a comment from Amanda about regenerative development. I think that's a separate issue. That's a national issue, really, rather than for this. Um, but Amanda, happy to talk about that separately. Um, yep. Ursula it says, I don't know if you can read it, Rachel. Yeah. Um, where views are protected in the local NDP, is that different than a non-material planning consideration around view? Um, yes. So there are um, there will be areas that have landscape designations um, where they are protected for their views. So, for example, the um, AO and Bs, the areas of outstanding natural beauty, um, those are. They are material planning considerations. There will be designations in the local plan. Um, for example, we have our kind of local character assessments, which are taken into consideration. What I mean by kind of loss of view is people looking out their windows and saying, I used to be able to see fields. Now I can see roofs of houses. Yeah, um, okay. it's, it's more that kind of view, but the sort of more strategic scale, looking into the national park, looking out of the national park, those sorts of things are different to they are material planning considerations. Yeah, that's different. And that's too. where visual impact assessments come in. Yes, yeah, it's landscape and visual impact assessments for okay. kind of large scale okay. stuff. So yeah. this is household views rather than landscape views. Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Right. Yeah, landscape views are definitely are. Are considered. Yeah. Yes. Um, and most local authorities have a landscape officer who do look at that yeah. these issues, but we're not really covering that tonight particularly. No. Okay, next question was, um, what about volume of comments? This was your point that you made very strongly that we can't consider the volume of um, yeah. objections. Volume of comment at LP, uh, local plan at consultation stage. Um, again, it's more about the content of those comments than it is the number of comments. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one because, um, yeah, we do take into account the kind of local need local desire for those sorts of things but also we are not able to if we are given us um if a site comes forward um i.e a developer or actually at that stage it's more likely a landowner has put their site in we cannot say this is really unpopular with local people because they just don't want development um and we have 300 people saying they don't want development we can't take that as a um material planning consideration what we can do is if those comments say things such as we think this is going to have a detrimental impact on x protected species we think it will have a detrimental impact on highway safety highway capacity those comments are more helpful in terms of us being able to then go and seek the evidence to support those um and to then kind of get into those material considerations we could have one comment that brings up all of those things and that will have as much impact as 70 comments that bring up all of those things it's yeah. the content of them that matters yeah. okay no that's good so that point is really important isn't it yeah okay uh, so the next one uh, uh let's say sustainable development um so tim says sustainable development is quite contested as an idea yeah. what does it mean in the context you describe um so there's the kind of classic um definition of sustainable is um looking at social impacts, economic impacts, and environmental impacts. Um, it tends to, when people talk about sustainable development, it tends to lean towards the kind of environmental side of things. But essentially it is um, looking at all of those three areas of impact. Um, will the development kind of be able to satisfy the economic, the social, and the environmental needs of the area the pressures of the area the challenges in the area for in those three categories um so for example a um I'm trying to think of an example if i've got one but you know a, an edge of it that edge of exeter development might be considered sustainable because um it has local business kind of encouragement within it um environmentally it's kind of ticking all the boxes in terms of um 
kind of net gain, those sorts of things. It's protecting protected species. It's giving us um, a better environment in those areas. Um, socially, it's, you know, it's a well-connected community. It links to other communities. It could be considered unsustainable because it's going to cause more people to use the roads. It's going to cause more people to travel into the middle of Exeter, which is not necessarily a good thing. And it's about that kind of balance. It's about working out whether or not um, a development that comes forward is able to kind of achieve those categories. Yeah. As you said, it is the thing with planning is it is um, a lot of it is kind of professional judgment rather than something that is directly measurable. Um, we try to create things that are directly measurable, but in the end, it is down to professional judgment and sort of previous case law, really. Yeah. Okay, no, that's yeah. great. So it is, yeah, it is contested. Actually, that's great, great. <laughs> we need to move on quickly. So yeah, this, uh, hope this might be quicker. How long does the plan last? Um, varies from place to place. They tend to be about 30 years, but they get reviewed every five years. Okay, right. So, last is that right? <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm just saying they will plan for 30 years, but um, there is a requirement to review your plan every five years to check that it's meeting all of those tests. Okay, okay. And, uh, okay, last one, and then we need to move on to Tom, I'm afraid. Um, so, um, uh, I don't know if you can see this, so an updated local plan trumps neighbourhood plans produced prior to this updated one on every feature, if they contradict. Um, Again, I'm not 100% certain. They are, in theory, they are not supposed to contradict. If you have your neighbourhood plan in place and the new local plan is being produced, the new local plan will be required to take into account the contents of the neighbourhood plan. The only, um, the only way it will be able to trump essentially what is in the um, neighbourhood plan is if there are new material planning considerations that suggests that that needs to be changed I, if there's new evidence that's come forward and says actually we don't think that site is sustainable therefore we are going to designate it as x okay. um it, there will have to be a material planning reason essentially for it trumping okay. it they can't sure. just go oh we'll wipe that out it's a uh, yeah and that's why kind of that engagement is really important um so that we understand where those policies have come from and how they yeah how yeah. they are wanted locally and what that means for our local plans. All right. Okay. That is great, that's Rachel. Good. I mean, not we, too long. <laughs> no, that's great. Endless discussion yeah. about this. <laughs> it's huge, huge. Yes, bit, it is. It? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but this is a whistle stop tour of planning. So please, yes. again, do keep sending us <laughs> questions. Let us know how we could do this again and what else you would like in terms of any training or webinars or yeah. real life sessions in the future. And again, um, if there are kind of, yeah, if there's sort of frequently asked questions, I'm happy to pull something together to okay great yeah so do keep no putting stuff in chat as you think about it yeah. um because unfortunately rachel has got to leave us now so i, do, and I yes. will probably be unable to <laughs> answer any tricky uh planner type questions yeah. um so but do put them there anyway and we can come back to you uh great thank you rachel stop sharing my screen hopefully uh, and then, um yeah enjoy the rest of your evening okay thank Thanks. you bye-bye um so uh, over now, uh, so that was a whistle stop tour of planning local plans and development management. And so Tom is now going to give a uh, whistle stop tour of ecology. So um, this is what Tom and I do on a daily basis is comment on planning applications to ensure uh, that they're meeting ecological requirements. So we just thought that we could, this is a presentation Tom really pulled together for internally, I think, wasn't it, Tom? But um. Yeah so we've tweaked it slightly um so do let us know what you think and if it's too much or not enough or anything else you'd like to hear more of in the future um but over to tom for wildlife Brilliant. Stuff. uh thank you um yes as sarah says uh i'm work with sarah and sarah's team as devon county council ecologist but uh, we do a lot of work for local district councils as well so uh we deal with larger scale Devon County schemes but also smaller scale sort of uh, housing developments as well uh, and this really will be a quite a quick whistle stop tour of uh, our role and uh, wildlife issues and considerations in the planning system so again if you have any questions uh, and we, are, we aren't able to cover them in depth today put them in a chat function and we will get back to you on them. Um, 
So, so Tom, if, Tom, just before you get, if anyone puts anything in chat, which I think it's worth stopping you on, just to give a bit, I will stop you, but I won't do that unless I feel I have to. All right. Fine. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, a little bit, uh, as I see, following on from Rachel's discussion, um, just a bit on the planning process in terms of the nitty gritty uh, aspects of it. Uh, so really this could be sort of split down to four key points, which are uh, pre-application stage, uh, validation, consultation, and uh, determination. So that's sort of the four stages of, uh, of a planning decision. Um, uh, and uh, what I've done there is to sort of in, say where myself personally inputs into, but uh, what, what the four stages are. So pre-application is sort of self-explanatory really in a way. So that is uh, prior to the submission of the application, uh, a developer or uh, applicant can uh, ask for uh, uh, the LPA, the local planning authority, to review what they've done or to provide them with information that they need to include as part of the planning application. Um, and uh, from an ecological point of view, uh, part of the pre-application process is filling in of our trigger list, which is the image on the right there. Uh, and what that does is a, a list of uh, a whole host of questions, um, and it gives an indication to the applicant at a very early stage uh, whether a wildlife report is is needed. So for your large scale applications, it's self-explanatory really that a wildlife report would be needed, but for some smaller scale stuff, so roof, roof developments or, or extensions or that sort of stuff, uh, this document can actually be really useful uh, because it highlights early on to the applicant when an ecologist is needed to be involved. Um, so the next stage is validation. So that is when the uh, applicant submits all the documents to the local planning authority, uh, and then it is validated by the planning officer. Uh, and uh, different local planning authorities have different validation requirements. They are very broadly very similar in terms of what documents need to be submitted uh, with what different types of application. So, uh, for example, um, the Exeter City validation requirements are for for you know any roof. Uh, extension or any work to a roof space uh, a, a bat survey is required so it's that sort of stuff so at that stage if, if that is the type of application if it is a, a, a roof any works to a roof and a bat report has not been uh, submitted then the application cannot be validated until that report is uh, provided um, once it's validated essentially that's when it gets put online and that's when it goes out for to consultation so uh, that is where the local planning authority will make an assessment on whether the submitted information is sufficient in order to allow them to make uh, a planning decision on whether to grant or not grant the, pl the planning consent. Uh, and it is at this stage that the LPA consult both statutory consultees, so uh, that is, you know, Natural England, Southwest Water, the Environment Agency, that sort of stuff. Um, and this is also where community groups and parish councils and that sort of stuff, uh, members of the public can, can comment on planning applications. So this is when they get put online uh, and all the documents get put online um, and uh, community groups, people can comment on them. Um, and as part of my consultation or our consultation, um, we use uh, DBRC data. So if anyone attended the previous DBRC webinar, uh, we use uh, DBRC data, it's in order to inform uh, our uh, uh, consultation responses um, and so do a lot of other LPAs they have uh, service level agreements with DBRC to provide them a wildlife data in order to help them inform their consultation responses uh, for ecology uh, and then the final stage is determination so that's when planning consent is either granted or not granted um, and uh, we ensure that all mitigation is uh, conditioned or that section 106 is set up and I'll touch on all of that uh, moving forward. Uh, so that's sort of the four stages uh, of a planning application. Um, what in terms of ecology is then required uh, is is slightly different um, uh, or it has some specific requirements really in terms of what we need to be able to make some assessments. Um, so as I mentioned before the Devon trigger table uh, should be used to clarify whether a wildlife report is needed. Uh, if a wildlife report is needed due to the nature of the, the planning uh, application, uh, then that should sub be submitted by a suitably qualified ecologist. Um, you can't have a, a, a architect, for example, submitting a, a BAT report. It needs to be a suitably qualified ecologist. 
um, and who is ideally a member of CIEM. So CIEM is the Chartered Institute of Environmental Management. That's our sort of accredited body that uh, all ecologists should, should ideally be under. Um, and the, the reason it's, I say ideally is that sometimes we do get super qualified ecologists that aren't members of CIEM, uh, but it really sh it is really um, uh, ideal if they are, because if there are any issues or if they are, you know, uh, making uh, mistakes and that sort of stuff, there is a way of then uh, contacting CIEM to sort of uh, explain that to them. So that is really the accredited body that ecologists are held to. Um, and from a sort of LPA's point of view, all the ecology information um, needs to be provided so it's sufficient so that we can determine fundamentally what the impacts on wildlife are uh, and what are the required mitigation or compensation uh, requirements uh, in order to make that planning application acceptable. And again, I will touch on wildlife impacts and mitigation later on in, the, in my talk, but essentially that is what we're looking for uh, with any information submitted what are the impacts and what is the required mitigation and, and is that mitigation achievable essentially at a fundamental level um, and wildlife reports whilst also being created by a suitably qualified ecologist they also need to follow national guidance uh, again uh, there's CIM guidance on how to write ecology reports um, and uh, they also have to be in line with national good practice guidelines so um, for your back for your uh, species surveys and that sort of stuff. Um, and there's some examples there of what national guidance the wildlife reports need to sort of be in, in line with. So that's fundamentally what the report needs to be like or, or contain. Um, as uh, Rachel mentioned, um, the statutory duties based on our planning decisions from an ecological point of view, are again, boiled down to two real key considerations but two key considerations in, in total really and that is uh, wildlife um, policy so as again as, as Rachel commented on um, that includes the, the two down the bottom that I've put there so your, your MPPF um, uh, sort of national level uh, and also local plan policy so it has to be in line with ecological and environmental policy uh, and also legislation requirements so uh, that includes the uh, Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act 2006, which, uh, as I've put there, uh, puts a, a regard on planning authorities to, to have due regard in exercising its functions for the purpose of conserving biodiversity. So that is a function that a planning authority has to prove that it has done uh, when, when assessing any planning application. Um, the second one is uh, the Conservation of Habitats and Species Regulations 2010, which again, I'll go on to talk about, but that is our European uh, uh, legislation dealing with species and sites and that sort of stuff uh, and as part of that law uh, competent authorities of which local planning authorities are included uh, must have regard in the exercise of their functions the requirements of the habitats directive uh, insofar as they may be affected by the exercise of their functions i.e uh, uh, protected European protected species and sites that need to be a material consideration of any planning decision uh, and then finally the final bit of uh, legislation is the um, uh, that I've listed there is the wildlife and countryside act uh, which again I'll go on to talk about but that is the sort of predominant piece of uh, UK based legislation for protected species uh, so, so fundamentally whenever we're making a planning decision or whenever a planning authority makes a decision based on ecology it is always being linked back to policy and legislative requirements um right so i'll start uh and apologies if i if i chuckle that picture uh, always makes me laugh so i'll try and get through this slide um i'll start by talking about european protected species um and the relevant legislation for them so as i mentioned before european the european legislation is the uh, conservation of habitats and species regulations 2010 uh, which, you, which is also commonly referred to as the Habitats Regulations or the Habs Regs. Uh, so that is the European um, uh, legislation. Uh, and for the time being, we'll just focus on species at the moment. So as part of the European uh, legislation, it makes it a criminal offence to, uh, as I've listed there, capture, injure, kill or disturb certain species listed under those regulations. And again, I'll touch on those. Um, obstruct access to a resting or sheltering place for those species 
uh, and also damage or destroy a breeding site or resting place for those species. So that is obviously a uh, horseshoe bat on the right hand side. Um, so again, uh, as I'll go on to touch on, it will make it a criminal offence to, to kill a bat, to kill a bat such as that, or obstruct or damage or destroy uh, access to their breeding site or roosting site. Um, and as again, we'll touch on, as some of you may know, certain activities which impact upon European protected species uh, can be made lawful with the granting of, of licenses. And again, I'll touch on that uh, briefly towards the end. Um, so, so yes, so European protected species, uh, they're the three offences. Um, so there is uh, under schedule two of the habitats regulations, uh, that's where the species are listed uh, and in Devon, uh, there's, there's, there's obviously other numbers uh, about throughout Europe, uh, which aren't relevant to Devon. Some species aren't relevant to us, but in Devon, uh, these are the species that we sort of uh, work with mainly. So every, all species of UK bat uh, are a European protected species. Uh, the common dormouse is pictured there, uh, the European otter and the great crested newt. So I'll touch on uh, those species uh, now. So bats, UK bats, uh, we have a number of species of UK bats and uh, they need a range of habitats. So broadly speaking, bat requirements can be split into three things. Uh, that is uh, a roost, so their resting place or sheltering place where they, where they roost. Uh, and bats um, can roost in a number of different things, uh, usually buildings for the smaller species, um, but also trees and other structures such as bridges uh, or tunnels uh, and uh, a lot of uh, important hibernation sites are um, mines or, or tunnel systems. Um, they also need foraging habitat, so where they feed. Uh, and obviously, as, as you may be aware, they're all insect insectivorous, so they uh, eat, eat flying insects. So uh, the habitats which support high abundance of flying insects are the better foraging habitat for bats. So woodland, parkland, grassland, wetland, water bodies, and, and also hedgerows. Uh, and finally, commuting habitat. They need the uh, they navigate via echolocation, so they need uh, linear features in order to navigate their way around the landscape. So uh, hedgerows, tree lines, uh, rivers, streams, and large trees, that sort of stuff, is what they use to sort of navigate their way around. Um, so for, for bats, in terms of uh, planning, um, there's a number of different surveys that are needed in order to ascertain whether bats will be impacted by whatever development is going on. So uh, for individual buildings, uh, you know, a, a, a roof conversion or a, or a building demolition or something along those lines, um, they are known as roost inspections, or uh, you might see them being uh, listed as uh, emergence or re-entry surveys. Uh, and essentially that is where an ecologist will visit the building and assess it, uh, assess its capabilities in supporting a bat roost. Uh, and then the emergence and re-emergence surveys is where uh, ecological consultants will sit outside the building uh, and see whether any bats emerge from it essentially uh, and soon as they do soon if they do find bats that emerge from a building then that is obviously a confirmed uh, bat roost uh, and uh, the ecologist will then have to plan accordingly uh, in terms of what then how the development will impact on that roost but essentially that is the uh, the sort of uh, building uh, surveys that are done for bats most commonly um, and for the sort of larger, uh, sort of mainly the sort of housing developments, so developments that take over quite a large area, so not restricted to just individual buildings, um, bat activity surveys or, or static surveys as well, as you might see it read, um, are, are used to sort of ascertain uh, numbers uh, of bats using a particular site or whether a certain feature of a site is, is of high importance to bats. So. Um, whether in a field uh, there is a particular hedgerow that um, is of greatest importance to bat species. So the idea of the bat activity in static surveys is to sort of understand how and where bats are using sites. So then it can be, uh, the, the development can be designed in order to, to help allow bats to continue to do that essentially. Um, and uh, the key bit of guidance for ecologists when doing bat surveys is the uh, Bat Conservation Trust Bat Surveys for Professional Ecologists Good Practice Guidelines. So again, part of our job in determining planning applications is we have to ensure that any bat surveys are done in line with those good practice guidelines. 
Uh, and if they're not, we have to question why not, um, because obviously if they are outside of those guidelines, then then perhaps the conclusions that are drawn by any surveys um, may differ to, to if they were done within those guidelines. So we, we that's the sort of uh, thing that we always have to, to bear in mind. Uh, and just some examples of activities that can harm bats um, and their and their roosts is um, obviously the, the, in, the main ones are loss or damage, disturbance to a roost site. So a building that's a confirmed bat roost, if it was to be demolished, obviously that, that would lead to loss or damage of that roost. Um, but also uh, some indirect impacts. So uh, loss or illumination of foraging habitat. Uh, so the removal of hedgerows or even um, the, uh, the lighting, uh, bats are very sensitive to artificial light. So the illumination of key foraging or commuting routes for bats um, can have detrimental impacts on the species because they, the bats will, will tend to, a uh, large number of species of bats will tend to avoid lit areas. So in that case, they may have to be flying further uh, around development uh, in order to ensure that they avoid the lit areas uh, in which case that can have detrimental impacts on bat species because they're, they're obviously not very big uh, and having to fly additional distances can can be quite damaging to them. Um, and similarly, illumination or, or loss of foraging habitat is, they, again, they have to fly further or potentially go without foraging, um, which is, is detrimental to them. Um, but also um, something to, to bear in mind for, for the larger scale developments, so new roads and new housing schemes with lots of different roads in them, um, bats can be susceptible to increased traffic and traffic collisions. Uh, and that's mainly due to the, the height that bats fly at. So um, bats don't, some certain species of bat don't fly at particularly high levels. So they can actually, if they are flying across roads or if we're putting a new road in where there is a confirmed bat flight line, uh, they fly, at, they, they, without mitigation, they can fly at certain levels and makes them quite susceptible to to uh, collision with, with oncoming vehicles. So just another way that uh, activities could harm bats. Uh, door mice, um, uh, Devon is a stronghold for door mice. Um, they, are, they are very much all over the county um, and uh, they are uh, an arboreal species of mouse. So they spend uh, all the summer uh, above ground um, and therefore they rely on uh, habitats that have dense understories that means they don't have to go to go at ground level essentially so deciduous woodlands hedgerows and scrub are the favored habitats so ones where there's a uh, a real dense understory that allows them to to stay above ground uh, they can also be found in conifer plantations and gorse um, so they they sometimes they can show um they can be in other habitats uh, but mainly given they're arboreal during the summer months uh, anywhere that they can just stay above ground um, is best. Um, Dormice uh, are one of the few rodent species and maybe our only UK rodent species that hibernate during the winter. So uh, in the summer, as I've mentioned, they're arboreal. So they, they make their breeding nests uh, up in tree, in vegetation, in woody vegetation. Um, uh, and in the winter, they actually hibernate at ground level. So they will hibernate under leaf litter or at, at, underneath root balls at ground level in in hibernation nests so that's where they spend their year so um yeah essentially from november through to april they're on the ground asleep and then in the summer they are above ground in the in the woody vegetation um survey methods for dormice uh include uh nest tubes essentially to understand uh how many or, or where dormice are using a particular site um so in terms of um, what that means for surveying them, Natural England survey guidance on dormice uh, means that there's there's a whole thing online, so it's, it's best to Google it. But essentially, they have to you have to hit a certain index score when you're doing your surveys. So um, you have to put um, a certain number of nest boxes out uh, in order to hit your index probability. So as as it shows there, um, it, certain months a score certain. Uh, certain points essentially and you have to hit 20 with with 50 nest tubes bear with me one second i'm just about to let the dog out so give me two seconds <laughs> sorry 
sorry, everyone. Tom will be back. That is the joys of working from home, isn't it? Uh, anyway, uh, yes. So um, again, much like the Bat Conservation Trust guidelines that we use for bat surveys, uh, we have to make sure that any hazel dormouse surveys, any dormouse surveys, are in line with these guidance. So. For example, if, if a survey was done uh, and an index score of 20 wasn't reached, then um, using the, the survey guidance, we, we can't uh, determine that as, as uh, a, a negative result, essentially, and we, we would have to question that. Um, uh, activities that can harm dormice, uh, again, um, some of them pre self-explanatory, so obviously habitat loss, damage or disturbance of habitats, uh, habitat fragmentation. So uh, again, because they're arboreal, they, they don't tend to go on the ground and, and although there are records of them crossing uh, small gaps, they don't tend to cross large areas on the ground. So any loss of sort of arboreal habitat uh, in terms of severance will obviously prevent them from moving around a particular site. Um, and they are also very susceptible to predation by domestic cats um, because they tend to be very slow, um, slower than and not very street smart. So um, again, that is a consideration that's brought in at large housing allocations uh, and uh, with, with regards to uh, domestic cat numbers and that sort of stuff. Uh, otter, uh, again, Devon, we're quite lucky with, with very much a stronghold for otters. Um, uh, and again, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, but they're aquatic, semi-aquatic and marine uh, animals. So they, they prefer the aquatic and marine habitats, so rivers, streams, ditches, lakes, reed beds, marshes, estuaries, and coastal waters. So that's where you find your otters. Um, so their resting place, so whilst a, a resting place for a bat is a bat roost, uh, a resting place for a dormouse will be its nest. Um, a resting place for an otter is uh, what's known as a halt, uh, which is essentially a large burrow which they, they build into, earth, uh, into river banks uh, or underneath tree roots. Uh, and it's essentially yes, just a sort of a, a big hole in the in the in the bank where they uh, mate and raise young and also rest uh, throughout the the day. Um, uh, and usually otter surveys consist of uh, walking up and down uh, waterways and marine habitats, uh, looking for springs uh, and feeding remains and and that sort of stuff. So it's really important that whenever doing, they are quite elusive species. So you're unlikely to see an otter whilst doing a survey. So whenever otter surveys are done, it is important that the ecologist is suitably experienced in, in otter uh, signs. Um, otters, again, some sort some uh, uh, impacts to them. They're, they're very susceptible to disturbance. Uh, so, um, and an obvious one again is, is road schemes near watercourses. So if a, if a new watercourse or a, a scheme restricts a watercourse, which forces an otter up and over the road, that obviously um, is an impact that they can be susceptible to, to um, traffic collisions. Uh, maintenance of water bodies, so bridges and culverts, again, restricting the width of certain culverts or in, in um, making culverts longer can have impacts on otters uh, impacts to banks and riverbank vegetation again given that's where they uh, make their halts they can be susceptible there uh, and they're also very um, vulnerable to pollution and also artificial lighting of watercourses they, they don't like disturbance or and obviously water pollution given they are aquatic um, is, is a key impact uh, and finally, for the European uh, species, uh, is the great crested newt, which is uh, Britain's largest newt um, with his jazzy flare on the back of his head. Um, they can occur all over. In Devon, our records of, of great crested newts are quite sparse. Um, we're sort of right on the edge of their western range. They are far more common in the south and southeast. Um, but they can occur in rural, urban, and suburban habitats. They, they are quite uh, ubiquitous. Um, obviously, readily found in medium-sized ponds. Uh, they spend the majority of the year actually on land um, and they only go back into their ponds to breed. Um, but uh, the, a key indicator of great crested newt presence is a breeding pond or a suitable breeding pond within 500 meters. They don't travel particularly long distances outside of the breeding period. So um, whilst they spend a lot of their time in sort of tall grassland, uh, much, like a, much like frogs, scrub hedgerows and woodland edge habitats uh, the, the key indicator for whether great crested newts are um, present on development sites is suitable breeding ponds within 500 meters of that site essentially um, 
again, um, uh, so these hibernate in winter as well, much like most of our reptile, if not all of our reptile species, and they'll, they'll hibernate underneath rocks and, and that sort of stuff. And then they congregate in their ponds from late February and breed uh, all the way through until May and when they leave and go back to their uh, terrestrial habitats. Um, in Devon, we have uh, great crested new consultation zones where we have put five kilometer buffers around confirmed breeding ponds. Um, because our records of great crested newts are so sparse, um, we, we've done that to, to get the ecologists to think about great crested newts whenever they're in those consultation zones. So if there is a pond uh, with adjacent to or within a development and it's also within a consultation zone, Great crested newts should be a consideration of, of that, and, and the ecologist should consider them as part of any uh, wildlife uh, report. Uh, survey methods for newts. Uh, the first survey method is what's known as a habitat suitability index, which is essentially a, a table uh, which you fill in a number of uh, uh, questions and it pops out a score for the pond as to whether it's suitable for great crested newts and whether it can uh, is suitable for, for breeding. Uh, so it might be something about how shady the pond is or whether it's whether there's fish uh, or whether there's uh, algae or anything like that. And that will uh, have a, a score. Um, uh, and if the pond is deemed suitable for great crested newts, there's sort of another two stages of surveys. And one you may read is, is known as eDNA testing, where a sample of the water is taken and sent off to the lab. Uh, and all the DNA is then analysed. And if great crested newt DNA is found in that pond, then it normally then you move on to the final stage of survey, which is uh, bottle strapping, searching for eggs, and also torching. So torch surveys of those ponds um, to see where if they are present. Uh, activities that can harm great crested newts, again, loss of habitat, habitat fragmentation, and pollution, given they are aquatic. Uh, and there's an example of the um, consultation zone. Uh, and how far reaching across Devon it is. Uh, so as I mentioned at the start, some activities uh, can uh, be made lawful with the um, acquisition of a uh, European Protected Species Licence from Natural England. Um, so any activity that's likely to result in an offence being committed, so those three key things at the start, um, if, a, if one of those things will happen, then uh, a licence from Natural England is needed. Um, and the consultant ecologist deals with all that, that's their job essentially. Uh, but what they have to do for the purpose of planning is we must be satisfied as a local planning authority that these three tests are met. So uh, these three bullet points are met. So it is a responsibility of the applicant and the consultant ecologist to supply the local planning authority with all the information that allows us to answer these three questions or essentially um, satisfy us that these three uh, tests will be met. So the first one is, uh, preserving public health or uh, public safety or imperative reasons of overriding public interest. Um, the second one is there is no satisfactory alternative. Um, so, for example, you can't take out a hedgerow if you could avoid taking out that hedgerow. Essentially, you won't get a license if you could actually not take out the hedgerow, for example. Um, and then finally, for sort of an ecological one, the first two are sort of planning tests, really. Uh, but the final one is the ecology test, which is it will not be detrimental to the maintenance of the species concerned at favourable conservation status in the natural range, i.e. Uh, the development uh, won't have a detriment, detrimental impact uh, on um, dormice or bats or otters as a whole uh, in their natural range. Uh, so exam for example, um, that can be very much determined on numbers, uh, location. Um, so uh, grey long-eared bats, for example, are particularly rare in Devon. So uh, a large, important maternity roost of grey long-eared bats. If there was development that was to happen to that roost, potentially, if it couldn't be mitigated or if there was if there was going to be a complete loss of that roost or whatever, that, that may not satisfy that third test. Uh, but an individual pipistrelle roost, given how common they are and how frequently they're found in, in houses, one common pipistrelle roost, is likely to, you know, even if that roost is lost, one pipistrel uh, is not likely to be detrimental to the maintenance of pipistrels in their natural range. So, you know, we, we, we may be more likely to grant a license or naturally the more likely to grant a license based on that. Um, if for whatever reason, the three tests cannot be met, um, then planning permission should not be granted. 
and we need to keep a formal decision of that. Um, if we are satisfied that the three tests will be met and naturally we will grant a license, then obviously planning consent can go ahead as long as all the other policy and legislative requirements are met. Uh, and this is this is quite in, uh, important, really. To um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but uh, wildlife law and legislation with regards to licenses and planning, uh, whilst they are uh, sort of integrated at this stage in terms of um, the LPA have to be satisfied with the three tests, they are also separate um, uh, separate things in a way. Yeah, because for example, even if a scheme or or something that didn't require planning permission you would still need to uh, go through the licensing process if a protected species is going to be impacted. Um, but, and, and you know, even if it's irrespective of a planning uh, decision, um, but it's essentially what this means is that the local planning authority can't grant planning permission for a scheme that will never be made legal because a license will never be granted. So we need to have that information as part of the planning application to ensure that we're not giving permission to a scheme that that is not going to ever be made legal essentially that's that's the, that's where they're linked um i've mentioned uh sort of mitigation compensation and enhancement and i realize what the time is i'm trying to rattle through these um uh, mppf uh planning policy framework mentions the mitigation hierarchy um and uh essentially um where development cannot satisfy this mitigation hierarchy then then it should be refused so uh, mitigation hierarchy is avoidance, mitigation, compensation, and enhancement in, in that order. So at all stages, uh, whether it's species, um, again, I'll repeat this at the uh, when we talk about habitats, but uh, can can it be avoided? Can the impact be avoided? Have they demonstrated that it, essentially it can't? Um, uh, if it can, uh, but they're still pressing ahead with the planning uh, application, we have to ask that question. And if they can't evidence that they, they can avoid impacts uh, then again as per the MPPF uh, planning should be refused. If they can't avoid it and there is going to be an impact then obviously uh, we need to mitigate that or, or minimize that harm uh, with mitigation uh, so an effective mitigation measure may well be uh, the building uh, the pitch to the right there which is a replacement bat roost building so you're losing a bat roost but that is being mitigated by the, the development of this new bat roost for example so the number of bat roosting features is hasn't gone down hasn't been decreased um uh, and the third one is even though you've put mitigation on site or whatever and, and you, you have put some mitigation stuff in place there's still going to be a detrimental harm then as a last resort this is always a last resort in terms of uh mitigation um in terms of the, the hierarchy um it, well, last resort would be compensation so to provide sort of measures to provide an equivalent value of biodiversity. Sometimes uh, that could be off site, for example. So if you, you, you get uh, you're in your red line boundary development, you've done all the mitigation you possibly can in your red line uh, boundary, but there's still a loss of biodiversity or there's still an impact, then you have to compensate for that somewhere else potentially. And that is compensation. And then enhancement is something that we always push towards where we can. Uh, and that's essentially measures that will improve ecology on a development site above any um, mitigation or compensation measures so it's enhancing uh, above the impact essentially. Um, so now on to UK species and again I'll rattle through these pretty quickly but this is again the Wildlife Country Site Act is the main UK legislation with regards to uh, biodiversity and ecological protection so species uh, for this one uh, all wild birds are protected under Wildlife and Countryside Act. So uh, it makes an offence to kill or take any wild bird unless you have a licence. Obviously, you can get licences for shooting species like magpies or crows and that sort of stuff. But um, all birds are protected, their nests are protected, and their eggs are protected. So the nesting season, for example, it, it, which is why um, a lot of vegetation work is done outside of the nesting season because bird nests are, are protected by, by law. Uh, some bird species, such as the cell bunting there on the right hand side, uh, are offered further protection. Uh, they're known as Schedule 1 birds. So Schedule 1 birds include, as I said, cell bunting, kingfisher, barn owl, nightjar, um, peregrine falcon, that sort of stuff. They're protected. They have a further level of protection and they're protected by disturbance during the nesting period. Um, so that is an additional 
and not just from damage or destruction of the nest they're also if you prevent or disturb uh, a barn owl or something during the nesting period that also constitutes an offence uh, so in for, for soil buntings in Devon um, there's also some standing advice from the RSPB because Devon is a stronghold for, for soil buntings uh, and they're, uh, they're mapped uh, the soil bunting breeding territories which are the dark yellow blobs and the lighter yellow blobs are the consultation zones where soils need to be taken into account uh, and again that's all available on our Devon Environment Viewer which um, some of you may be aware I've got a link to that at the end um, uh, so species so there's also a schedule five of the act which links to species and protection of species uh, it's uh, again it differs subtly from the European protection um, but it's intentional killing injury or taking of any species under schedule five intentionally or recklessly damaging or destroying a place of shelter um, of any species under schedule five intentionally recklessly disturbing an animal in its place of shelter and intentionally recklessly obstructing access to its place of shelter. Uh, so it doesn't differ a great deal, but there are some subtle differences in wording, um, namely the word recklessly, which isn't included in the European legislation. Uh, so animals listed under Schedule 5 uh, are all European protected species found in Britain. They're also listed in the Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, but there are also a few more. So all UK, UK reptile species are also under Schedule 5. Uh, but they crucially are only uh, uh, protected from the first one. They're only protected from intentional killing, injuring, or, t or uh, killing an injury. So, i.e., you, you can legally pick up a slow worm and move it, uh, whereas legally you, you can't pick up and move uh, a dormouse, for example. Um, some other species uh, are also protected, but again, for slightly different things. So, frogs, common frogs are protected, but they're only protected from live sale, for example, unless you are licensed. So, uh, there's a few nuances there, um, but uh, yeah, essentially that's the protection that's afforded to, to species, so our, our protected species. Some other species on Schedule 5 include uh, the water vole, for example, so that is uh, protected from, from those four bullet points there, uh, whereas, as I said, reptiles are only uh, protected from intentional killing and injury. Um, uh, plant species, there's also a Schedule 8 known as uh, the Wildlife Countryside Act, which are, are protected plants uh, and where it is an uh, intentional, uh, an offence to intentionally pick, uproot or destroy any plant on that Schedule 8. So that includes something like strapwort, it's normally your, your rarer plant species. Um, there are a few orchids on there, but they're very, very rare in niche. Um, uh, and uh, but again, if you just you can find all these schedules online if you if you were ever in doubt. Um, Schedule 9 of the Wildlife Countryside Act relates to invasive species, so uh, it is illegal or an offence to release or to escape into the wild any animal or plant uh, under Schedule 9 or to cause to grow in the wild any plant listed in Schedule 9. So um, essentially under the Wildlife Countryside Act it is an offence to allow any of these species to spread off your land onto somebody else's land. Uh, it is not an offence to have it on your land. Uh, it becomes an offence when it spreads onto somebody else's land. Um, and some species are, uh, you, you may be able to be aware of, so giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed, uh, rhododendron, Himalayan balsam, um, crassula, which is like a, a, a water plant that used to be sold in, in, uh, in garden centres for, for ponds and that sort of stuff. So there's a whole, again, a whole host of plant, plants under Schedule 9. Uh, and in terms of what we need as the LPA, we need to obviously ensure that invasive species are covered by the ecology report and that if there are any on site, uh, any work doesn't lead to an offence happening, essentially. So if there are any, if there is Japanese knotweed and they have to take soil off site or whatever, we need to ensure that an offence isn't committed in that and that uh, the Japanese knotweed or the invasive species is dealt with prior to, to planning or prior to development and that sort of stuff. Um, there's a little uh, web link down there to the invasive, the Devon Invasive Species Initiative, which again has a lot more info on invasives. Uh, and finally, for species, uh, badgers um, not protected under the Wildlife Countryside Act, they have their own legislation. Uh, they are protected under the Badgers Act 1992, which essentially came in to make badger baiting illegal. Uh, really, so uh, it prohibits the taking, injuring, selling, possessing, or killing of badgers. And it is an offence to ill-treat any badger, damage, destroy, or disturb a badger set. 
unless you have a, a license, as mentioned at the bottom there. So there's four main Badger sets, you may be aware, uh, main sets, which is obviously where the main family group live, uh, annex sets, which are sort of offshoots from the main set, um, subsidiary sets, which are slightly smaller, but still relatively close to the main set, uh, and outlier sets, this is where uh, badgers, individual badgers usually go and roam around their territory and make a small set. Um, they are all protected, um, but uh, there are sort of varying degrees of whether a license is needed and what mitigation measures are needed. So for example, destruction of a main set would require uh, the developer to create uh, a completely new main set somewhere that is linked to the existing main set for example um but that that isn't a that isn't a requirement of of a destruction of an outlier set for example so there are a few uh, nuanced nuances in terms of mitigation requirements and as i said much like european protected species natural england can grant licenses with works for badgers um so priority species are, are species that are not legally protected but they oh, are protected. tom can yes. i just um, interrupt that Sorry, I've lost track. How much? I'm just aware of time. Yes, um, me too. How many, how many more slides have we got to go? I've got sites to go. Okay, Move so sites. Um, everybody, we are. So this is part of our learning process. There's a lot to cover here. So, um, so we'll just we'll just keep going, Tom. Yeah. So we're going to yes. do priority species and then habitats. And so, That's apologies, it, yeah. everybody. If anyone needs to go, please go. Oh, yeah, I won't um, take it personally if people just leave. <laughs> <laughs> just get us left at the end what yeah. you on about <laughs> um, <laughs> so yes yeah, so I, I cover i cover i finish on species this okay one. no that's fine tom so <laughs> i've been answering probably a bit annoyingly i don't know we'll get people sorts on that answering questions a little bit as we've gone along so we don't need to do questions at the end particularly okay. so like i said i'll whistle through these as keep, quick as i can keep going no great all right um, so priority species uh, are not are not legally protected species so that it can include stuff um so invertebrates, uh, a common frog, common toad, for example, they are priority species. They are not protected in law, but they are protected through policy. So as we've mentioned at the start, we must have regard in our planning decisions in protecting these species when carrying out our functions. So um, there's a whole list under Section 41 of the uh, Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act, which lists all the priority species. Uh, hedgehog is a, is a key example of a priority species. So housing development, for example, um, a, a, you'll see quite commonly that uh, housing developments will put or ex, you know, explain that they have to have hedgehog holes in fencing to allow hedgehogs to continue to move around uh, uh, the, the landscape. So it's, and, and again, so we still have to have due regard for, for priority species in our planning decisions. And we have to have evidence from the consultant ecologist or the applicant that they have taken priority species into account. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Devon and uh, a whole host of other people developed a, a Devon long and long list and special species list, which are key to Devon. So again, that was sort of uh, sort of a, a more local based priority species list. But again, we, we, we have to take regard of them in any planning decision. Right. So that was species. Um, I'll now move on to protected sites and then I'll finish on habitats. So uh, protected sites. So. Uh, going all the way back to the uh, habitats regulations at the start, which we dealt with for species as part of that directive, the EU habitats directive, uh, they also established a load of protected sites throughout Europe, also known as Natura 2000 sites, because there there's 2000 of them, I think, across Europe, although developed in the year 2000, I can't remember. But there's a whole host of them in Europe uh, designated as European protected sites, essentially. And that falls within two camps. Um, the Special Areas of Conservations, or SACs, um, and Special Protection Areas, or SPAs. So uh, on the map of Devon to the, to the right there, um, the reds are the SACs and the blue is, is the SPA. The, there is a bit misleading because a couple of them are actually both. So um, the X estuary is an SPA, but not an SAC, whereas Pebble Bed Heaths, which is the one slightly to the right of the X estuary, is both an SAC and an SPA. So uh, SACs, um, can include a whole host of sites and they're designated for a whole host of reasons. So Dartmoor Moorlands, uh, Dartmoor Woodlands, for example, the sand dunes at Braunton, um, Start Point and Plymouth Sound is a marine one off the, off the coast of Plymouth. So they've got a whole host of uh, qualifying features they're called. So that can be habitats or species 
uh, and they, they are therefore designated as those. So again, another example is Colm Grassland in, in Mid Devon. Um, whereas SPA, Special Protection Areas, are, are our important bird sites. Uh, so hence why in Devon it's the XS Street and uh, the Pebble Bed Heaps are uh, really important bird sites. So uh, that's the slight, slight difference. But these are the, our two protected European designations. Um, so obviously, in line with the legislation of the habitats regs, we need to ensure that any planning decision avoids impacting or uh, has no detrimental impact on European protected sites. So uh, we have to take into consideration uh, for these sites, both direct impacts, so direct habitat loss, um, and also indirect impacts, so uh, pollution, changes in water level, um, for uh, the South Hams SAC, which some of some people may be aware of, so the, the, that that's designated for greater horseshoe bats. Um, so indirect impacts uh, for that could be increases in lighting, as I've already mentioned for bats. So it's those sorts of things. We have to take both direct and indirect uh, impacts into account. Uh, and as the role of the planning authority, we're also known uh, in the sense of European sites, we're also known as the competent authority because we are the ones essentially that grant permission or give permission for development. Uh, we need to assess plans and projects to ensure that there is no impact on these European protected sites. And that process, which I won't go into because it is quite confusing and long, but essentially it's known as a Habitats Regulations Assessment or HRA. Uh, and um, any uh, sort of project or plan that has uh, potential to have direct or indirect impacts on a European site, we need to have a HRA completed and agreed with uh, Natural England. Um, and that is always prior to planning permission being granted. Um, so HRA guidance for a number of sites has also been uh, produced. So it has to be in line with that. Uh, so again, I've already mentioned the South Hams SAC. Um, there's a guidance document and I've, I've put a link to that at the end, but there's also uh, stuff on a load of different SAC. So recreational impacts is quite important. To, for, but uh, there's a guidance document for the Plymouth Sound and Tamar Estuaries SAC, for example. So any development that's likely to impact on that site has to also be in line with that HRA guidance. Um, UK designated sites are the one down from the European designations or national designations. Um, and uh, the example of that is a triple SI or site of special scientific interest, which some of you may be aware of. So again, these are UK sites, uh, some of which, not all, but some of which um, are also SACs. Um, and they are selected because they have special interest values, again, based on their fauna, flora, uh, or, or sometimes you can get um, geomorphical features. So um, not just biodiversity, but a whole host of reasons, sometimes geological uh, triple SIs. And again, uh, local planning authorities, we are required to protect triple SIs um, as part of both policy, local plan policies, but also development management, we need to ensure that triple SIs are protected because they are the highest level of, of national protection. Uh, and Natural England are basically the body that are in charge of um, sort of administrating all triple SIs. So we have to discuss with Natural England when we, they may be in effect on a triple SI and work with them and have agreement with them. And some actions within a triple SI or near a triple SI require separate consent from Natural England in terms of uh, what they're, they're called potentially damaging operations. And there's, uh, again, there's a link there to what they might be. But um, for example, this is a, an image of Slapton Sands in South Devon. So um, when the new road was done, when the new road alignment was put in, we obviously had to have a direct link with Natural England because it was uh, potential direct and indirect impacts on the trip SI. So we had to ensure that that wasn't the case. Um, so that's statutory. So there's your two statutory protections. So they are protected via law, essentially. They're legal, is a legal requirement to protect um, via law, triple SIs and the European designations. We're now down again to the non-statutory. So the similar way um, to priority species, um, non-statutory protected sites uh, have no legal protection. So uh, county wildlife sites, something you may have, you may have be aware of, uh, they have no legal protection, uh, but they again are, uh, protected via policy. Uh, so we have to have due regard of them in any decision that we make. So there, it has to be that if there is impact to a, a county wildlife site or potential impact to a county wildlife site, we have to take that into regard in making our planning decision because it is protected by policy. Uh, again, uh, the, the image on the right is the map of 
the county wildlife sites throughout Devon. Uh, there's over 2,000 of them actually in Devon. Um, but because they're not statutory protected, um, they aren't owned by a, some of them are owned by NGOs, but not all of them are. So some of them are just owned by normal landowners uh, and they have no legal obligation to protect their land. It's not like a triple SI. Uh, the, only, the only way they are protected uh, is via the planning process when we must have regard for them. So um, sometimes that can, we can have a bit of conflict there, but essentially planning, if there's planning impacts to a county wildlife site, we have to take that into consideration. And again, there's a whole host of different reasons for designation, species wise, but also can be different habitats. Um, and there's uh, a few other terms down the bottom there, which um, you may see on the Devon Environment Viewer, um, which are uh, proposed county wildlife sites. So um, they are ones that have been surveyed, sites that have been surveyed and are awaiting consideration as to whether they are designated formally as county wildlife sites. But there's also two others. So unconfirmed wildlife sites are. Um, sites which have been identified as potentially being county wildlife sites but have not yet been surveyed um, so um, again we they, those sites are known uh, but they don't they they don't have actually the same uh, policy protection but it's still something we have to take regard of uh, and then the final one down the bottom are other sites of wildlife interest or oswies which have been uh, sites that have been surveyed but they do not reach county wildlife site standards but they are still uh, of uh, you know some wildlife value but they may not reach the county wildlife site standard and a lot of them may well be oswies may well not be county wildlife sites but they might be priority habitats which i'll touch on uh, in a short while right now in fact i didn't even know what order my slides are going in um so uh, as i said priority habitats much like priority species are listed under section 41 of the natural environment and rural communities act so again as per planning policy, as per local plan policy, we must take regard of these habitats in any planning decision that we make, um, and they are a material consideration. So that can include, uh, and crucially, this includes, this, the, these habitats can be anywhere. They don't have to be within a site designation. They don't have to be within a county wildlife site. They don't have to be within a SSSI or a European protected site. They, they can be anywhere. So if the site, if the development site has a priority habitat on them, such as uh, woodland, lowland meadow, heathland, um, rivers, hedgerows, uh, for example, we must take any impact to those habitats as a consideration of the any uh, planning decision. Um, so, um, so yeah, and and as I'll touch on, I, I, uh, as I'll touch on in a minute, again, the, the mitigation hierarchy is applied for habitats, um, and then that feeds in sort of to the new biodiversity metric stuff. Uh, that's coming out so um, which I will touch on briefly at the end. Uh, ancient woodland again is a non-statutory protected site it's uh, essentially woodland that has existed since 1600 AD that is the official natural England um, uh, definition uh, you sort of get two types you get ancient semi-natural woodlands which are uh, obviously woodlands that have not been disturbed or uh, cut down they've developed naturally and have existed for a large number of years uh, and you also get plantations on ancient woodlands, which are ones which um, normally during the early 1900s were cut down and replanted with forestry. Um, so a lot of them are sort of conifer broadleaf woodland mixes, uh, but there is real potential for those sites to potentially return to ancient woodland. And um, they won't ever become ancient semi-natural woodlands again because they have been, uh, they have been, um, uh, you know, damaged in the past, but there is potential for those sites. Um, and again, these sites are not protected legally, but they are protected via planning policies. They are protected under paragraph 180 of the MPPF. So they are known as irreplaceable habitats along with veteran trees and, uh, and or ancient trees. Um, they are known as irreplaceable habitats in terms of national planning policy. So if there is any impact, um, and they can't, and it, there's no suitable compensation, and they can't be adequately mitigated or compensated. If there's any impact to an ancient woodland or an ancient veteran tree, um, it, the planning permission should be refused. Uh, and as I said, unless there's wholly exceptional reasons, such as HS2, apparently. Um, and Natural England and Forestry Commission have produced uh, a whole host of standing advice on um, ancient woodlands. And again, I've put the link at the uh, end of the. Uh, presentation and again that 
again, steps out a number of steps and, and suitable mitigation measures for ancient woodland. Uh, this is a slide that we've already seen, but it's important to, to mention it again. Mitigation hierarchy is again applicable for, for habitats. So it's exactly the same um, avoidance. Can we avoid removing or impacting on that habitat in the first instance? If we can't, then we have to look to mitigate for any uh, habitat loss. If it's a, you know, as I said before, if it's a priority habitat, um, then we have to mitigate for that loss. Uh, if we can't mitigate wholly uh, in the red line, then we might have to look at some uh, compensation off-site or in areas attached to where the impact is happening. And again, sometimes you can get uh, habitat enhancement where you make habitats better, which goes above and beyond uh, additional you know, uh, existing ecological value of those habitats. So you may it may be a management plan uh, or the removal of invasive species or uh, something like that to enhance habitats. And again, much like species, if, uh, for, for, for protected and priority habitats, if the mitigation hierarchy can't be, uh, if it can't satisfy that that's been met, then we don't, uh, we should refuse planning permission. Um, builds into biodiversity net gain slightly. I'm not going to spend too long on this because it could form a whole webinar on its own, but um, biodiversity net gain is essentially a, uh, uh, a way of planning development, uh, leaving ecology or, or having better biodiversity after development uh, as compared to to prior to development essentially uh, it's important to note that there's that the require the requirement for identifying and pursuing opportunities for biodiversity net gain is already a planning policy under the mppf um, so again that should be something that is asked um, whether there is any opportunities in identifying net gain um, but the real driver at the moment is the anticipated environment bill, which will come in hopefully at some point this year or maybe early uh, 2022. Um, and as part of that environment bill, it will uh, make it a statutory requirement for planning uh, development and planning applications of, of a certain size, which again, I won't go into, but it will make it a statutory requirement to provide a 10% a net gain in biodiversity. Um, and uh, essentially how you work out what a 10% net gain in biodiversity looks like is by using the DEFRA biodiversity metric, which is a um, sort of a habitat based approach. So it is purely habitat based. There isn't any species input into that. Um, it is a habitat based approach to assess an area's biodiversity value. So again, I'm not going to go into it totally, but there is uh, a number of different uh, tabs that you fill in. Uh, and then based on the habitats that are present on site, essentially the metric will spit out a value of, and that will determine your biodiversity units, they're called. Uh, and then the aim is, uh, well, not the aim, what will eventually become a statutory requirement is that you have to provide 10% more biodiversity units uh, after development um, compared to pre-development. Um, so at the moment, uh, LPAs throughout the country, but also in Devon, are at sort of different stages of biodiversity net gain. Some have a policy, so South Ham's District Council, for example, do have a net gain policy, and I think so the Team Bridge. Um, uh, and again, those policies are embedded within their local plans, uh, but some local planning authorities have not yet, uh, and they're still developing their strategy. So if there's no policy, then uh, net gain is I put currently voluntary. We can't, there's nothing we can we can't make them do it essentially we, again we just go back to the mppf and ask the question of whether they have identified and pursued opportunities for net gain if there is a planning policy that states net gain then obviously any sort of development that's under that that threshold uh, must must evidence that they've provided it and the uh, easiest way and the way that is now used most commonly is by submission of a, a defra biodiversity metric spreadsheet which looks a little bit like that um the ecologist mercifully fills that in uh, and then uh, the LPA checks it to make sure it's uh, all correct um, but again it's all all online which I've provided links to at the end uh, and finally very finally uh, with with Brexit which seems to be a lifetime ago but still hasn't fully been settled in terms of what that means for ecology and the planning system um, it's important to note that the EU directives for protected sites and uh, species under the uh, Habs regs have already been transposed into UK law. So uh, the UK sites, uh, the, the protected European sites 
as I mentioned, are all triple SIs. So not all triple SIs are European protected sites, but all European protected sites in Britain are triple SIs. Uh, and that's the same as, as I mentioned, with our European protected species. They are all already covered under the Wildlife and uh, Countryside Act. Um, where this will differ moving forward is in terms of the um, what sort of is required in terms of licenses or documentation to fill out to, to make things lawful that sort of stuff hasn't yet been identified but in terms of the actual protection for the current european uh, sites and species that has already been transposed into uk law so uh, it, the, their protection shouldn't change and uh, that is me done uh, and i appreciate it. i've talked for a long time so thank you very much for listening there's a there's a number of web links there for things that i've mentioned uh, which includes all the legislation uh, the DCC planning policy uh, planning pages and our wildlife planning pages, as well as some uh, wildlife trust PDFs about planning and wildlife law, standing advice, a link to the Devon Environment Viewer, um, and also a load of other standing advice on ancient woodland and net gain. Um, but there you go. Thank you for listening for what seems to have been the last two hours. Um, if Thank there are any you. questions, there I'm answered, please put them in the chat. So okay go, go, go. no that's brilliant thank you tom um, no that was epic um i think it's just made us realize how much stuff that is here oh i can't i can see me now that's horrible um so i think i've gone through lots of the questions we people ran out of questions by the time you got to habitat yeah, bored i think <laughs> um so um but it just shows you how complicated it all is really um and it would be really really useful because we want to keep going with this we want to do some more webinars on anything that would be useful for people for planning this was just like a bit of a whistle stop tour um so and we do want to have some feedback because we want to run something like this but i think we need to try and break it up more but it's hard to do that on a webinar it'd be so much better in real life um maybe give you a bit of a quiz or something um so if you could email uh nature at devon.gov.uk with any thoughts then that would be really really useful um so has anyone got any last minute questions or everyone just needs to go and get a beer and yeah i think that was, that was a strong drink yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah um, a piece of wall or something so uh so we've got in the chat just some maybe a stuff on biodiversity net gain so we definitely need to do that i'm trying to do some devon guidance on that at the moment um did i put the email in i was going I'll do, to I'll do, I'll do that now all right um Oh, Kat has. Thanks, Kat. Yeah. All right. Okay. Unless anyone has got anything else, just wants to unmute and just say anything. Um, that's it. So thank you very much to Rachel, who's gone. Um, and thank you to Tom. That was brilliant. Really useful overview. And thank you to everybody for listening. Um, yes, and just, thank you. Yeah, just do let us know what else we can do and do get involved in the planning process. But remember to only comment on relevant issues. Okay. Oh, hello. Sorry. Right. Can I ask a question? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I'm Tessa. Sorry, my camera's not on. Um, but uh, I did, the, the page that you had all the links on, um, how do we access that? Because obviously it's not interactive, so we can't, I mean, we'll how put the we... whole presentation onto the Local Nature Partnership website. So um, if you go on to um, Wild About Devon, um, we'll just make it really clear, but also put a link onto the front page of the website for the moment as well, so you can find it easily. Is that okay? Tessa, is that all right? She's gone. Yeah. Yes, that's fine. Thank you very much, Sarah. That's all right. Good. Any other, oh, it's quite nice to get other people talking. No offence, Tom. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, I'm sick of my um, at the end of that. Has anyone else? Want anything they want to say or share before we clock off? No. All right. Okay. In which case, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and thank you to Tom and Rachel. And see you in real life, hopefully, at one of these soon. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.